Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Hassan Baidun from Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Dr. Baidun completed his MD at the American University of Beirut in 2004. He then moved to the United States to pursue his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He then completed a fellowship in sports medicine and shoulder surgery at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. And after that, he went on for a fellowship with Professor Pascal Bolo and Giles Walsh in Lyon, France. He subsequently practiced in Pittsburgh, United States for several years before moving back to Lebanon in 2016. Dr. Baidun helps build the sports medicine program at the American University of Beirut and help establish the sports medicine fellowship, the first of its kind in the region. He currently serves as chief orthopedics at the Mubadala Health Point, the largest ortho program in the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Baidun has been invited lecture at several national and international meetings. He serves on the editorial board of multiple journals and he's an active member on committees of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He's active in research, has published several scientific articles, and has received several awards for both his clinical and research activities. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Hassan Baidun from Abu Dhabi. Over to you, Hassan. Thanks, Dr. Kopala, for the kind introduction. There's an echo. Yeah, you can carry on. Hassan. I can carry on? Yes. All right, awesome. So thanks so much uh, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for having me uh, and uh, Luai over. So we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, arthroscopic glenoid open abduction and thermal fixation and what I think of is a major minefield. Uh, so I'm going to present a case. He's a 48-year-old man who's a recreational soccer player and who I'd like to think of was assaulted by a goal, uh, by a goal post. Uh, he, thought, he thinks he was going for the final uh, save in a World Cup when in reality it's just a pickup game uh, on a weekday. I get a phone call, of course, uh, unfortunately, this guy's my cousin, and uh, you only get a phone call like this at around uh, midnight when you're about to go to sleep uh, and what to do. So I'm like, well, uh, the guy needs a CT scan, and lo and behold, here are his images. Uh, the minute I saw these images, I started thinking about my options and what to do, and in reality, there's not a single good option that we have. So... Uh, Anything that I thought of was I felt like a navigating a minefield. Uh, doing the initial, uh, the initial lit review on this did not reveal a lot. It was only a couple of case reports here and there, but they mostly revolved around the same thing. And the Sugaya article actually is uh, the landmark article on this, whereby the management of bony bank arts is through fixation at the superior and the inferior portion of it. Uh, but there is problems with that because the minute that you fix this on a medial hinge, you might actually, since this is only two point fixation in a single plane, you might have a lift off. Subsequent to that, uh, Peter Miller uh, from, uh, from uh, Colorado uh, added onto this because uh, he did a double row fixation to try and obviate that problem. Uh, that was at a time when we were double rowing everything. It allows for a larger contact area of fixation of bone on bone, but it also uh, was only amenable to fixation in very small fragments. The third report was actually came from Samir Hassan in Cincinnati, and Samir described an arthroscopic reduction in a cannulated screw fixation of a large anterior glenoid ring fracture. And uh, the reality is what to do uh, on this. And Samir was able to do that because uh, something worked to his advantage. Take a look at the fracture line over there. It was pointing uh, to uh, outside, uh, laterally, uh, when in reality, uh, most fractures of the glenoid are going to be actually aiming medial, and that's where you're going to be running into uh, uh, problems because you're in line with the axillary nerve, with the uh, brachial plexus. You fast forward, and then this is after those cases that I started initially doing, and you'll find several techniques. Each and every one of them describes several processes, uh, but some of them uh, will not incorporate a labral repair, and you're gonna have to pass eight limbs across a medial row, which may be tricky. Uh, others of them require a double row fixation using three, four, five anchors described, and they try to walk you through the procedure 
But in reality, even after going through the procedure and seeing that, I, you still can't make a full understanding of all those steps. And if you take a look, I mean, it becomes what I would call literally a bag of sutures in the end. Uh, and then there's also arthroscopic Moni Bankart described uh, uh, from Thailand. And uh, there's pros and cons to this. The biggest pro is that it's a soft suture anchor, but the biggest con is that you're passing through the Moni fragment, which already is extremely small. And guess what? You might actually break that. Now I'm a person who likes simplicity. And what I did is I took the majority of what I understood from the literature. And what we did was we dissected the pieces of this cake and try to come up with the least amount of uh, ingredients. So uh, this is what we started off with, and I'm gonna walk you through a diagnostic scope which uh, through the arthroscopic portion of this case, which is going to be starting off with a very swift diagnostic scope, very extremely low pressure. And you're gonna identify your fracture, and then you can see how it's extremely low pressure and that's why you can still see it murky. And you don't wanna go because this is gonna be one of those long cases. So you don't wanna go on high pressure at any point. You want to insert your cannula using, uh, after you identify an ideal spot with uh, a spinal needle because you want room for those two uh, uh, cannulas uh, in the interval. Then you're gonna switch your viewing portal so that you can see from the front and you'll get a better understanding of what's happening right there in the front. You can see my switching stick there in the back and there you can identify how huge uh, uh, the fracture is in this case. And you're gonna need to debride the edges of the fragment all the way medially so that you can get bleeding bone. This is where you start inserting a medial anchor. And this is after the debridement, you can, you're gonna insert a medial anchor, which is going to be a soft tissue anchor. You really don't care about, uh, you don't wanna insert a hard anchor because uh, you don't know how much bone you have at that point. Then you're gonna keep those in there and you're gonna insert your inferior anchor as described by Sugaya in uh, inferior. So you're going to pass those inferior anchors. And this is practically the Sugaya technique. This is how you're doing a bank card repair inferiorly. And you're going to tie the first suture, both limbs, in a horizontal mattress. You could have seen that I passed both of them there. And then you do the same and you show. At that point, you would have fixed the inferior ankle and uh, the anchor, and you're gonna pass your medial sutures around my fragment. So you're gonna grasp the, fra the fragment itself. You're gonna pass it from medial and retrieve all four suture limbs. So you would have passed it around and retrieve the suture limbs from inside. At this moment, this is the construct of what you're gonna be having at this point in the case. Now you would have passed those and here you drill for the superior anchor. Again, this is now Sugaya technique. And this is what it's gonna, this is what the shoulder is gonna look like on the inside after you would have tied your superior anchor. And this is exactly what I was referring to with this medial liftoff. Because every time you do, I've done uh, a large bony bank cart, I had a large portion uh, sort of lifting off medially. The argument is that when you remove the traction off this shoulder, uh, this is gonna be pushed medially, but I don't like to leave anything for chance. So what I have here, at this point, as I tie down my two medial sutures on the medial aspect of the glenoid, and I insert a clock face anchor so that I can get the best so that I can get the best 
bony contact. And this is typically a knotless anchor. And I would have dialed the tension the way that I wanted. And you can see how my fragment is adequately fixed. This is my immediate post-op x-ray. I don't have liftoff and I can see how my anchors are in there. I can see how I've reproduced my clock face. Now, remember there are certain tips for success. In this case, the biggest pearls that I suggest are one, early surgical intervention. Take your time liberating the fracture site while attempting to maintain the labrum attached both superiorly and inferiorly. Verify that we can get attention-free reduction of the fragment. Remember, this is gonna be a long case, so you go on low pressure, and if needed, use reduction sutures. The biggest pros of this procedure is that stable fixation, your reduction is confirmed through the labral repair, so you're not having any guesswork on where it's gonna to have to happen. I have great bony fixation and with increased contact area, both medial and on the glenoid clock face. We only use a single glenoid anchor and we're not passing through the bony fragment and breaking it. The biggest con in this case that I've realized is that suture management can be difficult. Suture management can be difficult, but guess what? We have to learn how to do this. And this is the same patient, and this is what he looks like six months post-op. Coming down, I'm asking him to do active. And this is external rotation at 90. Some very slight limitation in internal rotation and he can move his hand behind his back. You can see the limitation in internal rotation there. This is another one of my patients. He was on vacation. Thank you. And he just sent me this video to thank me for what I would like to think of a job well done. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hassan, for that uh, brief presentation. Uh, Hassan, actually, you can stop sharing. Hassan, uh, thank you for this uh, interesting surgical technique. I mean, it's something new that people have not seen. And uh, what, what are the typical fractures that are available to this uh, arthroscopic fixation? Matter of fact, I've gone to 50% uh, of, uh, of the entire glenoid uh, clock face. You can see this was close to a 35, 40%. Actually that patient, uh, the one that was swimming is almost a 50%. I've done about five of those. And inevitably uh, what we care for is two things, stable fixation and good range of motion. So you have stable fixation, which allows them to have a stable shoulder, okay? and good range of motion. Uh, luckily, uh, some of them get some limitation, uh, but it's not something that they're not able to function through. And have you encountered any transverse fracture of the glenoid? Because if you work in a major trauma center, that is what you see, right? The transverse yeah, fracture that extends to the body. I, so th this I have not done uh, uh, through transverse fractures. Luckily, uh, my practice is for the most part an elective practice. Okay, and do you think uh, those can be approached well with this technique, transverse ones? Uh, so it's not technically impossible to do this with the transverse for one reason, because the transverse bisects the glenoid. So what you're fixing uh, needs to go all the way inferior and you're gonna be encountering the axillary nerve when you're passing on the inferior aspect. You can pass anteriorly uh, because you don't have any uh, neurovascular structures there anteriorly. Uh, sitting between uh, the capsule and the subscap, whereas inferiorly, you're going to encounter the axillary nerve passing just inferior to the capsule on the inferior aspect. And what is your normal position of the patient when you do uh, this position? I mean, this procedure. So I used to do uh, all of my uh, intraarticular work, my uh, labral work in a lateral decubitus. When I started having uh, residents uh, and fellows, I actually stopped. Uh, using uh, uh, lateral decubitus because it was easier for me to teach 
uh, only one position. So uh, for the most part, this is all beach chair position. Okay, so do you think there's a significant advantage for this particular surgery? I mean, suppose you want to involve some kind of percutaneous wires or something, is it possible? So using the CRM? Yeah, go ahead. No, if you want to use the image intensifier and cross check, do you think the beacher? You are looking at it. You are looking at it. Uh, uh, you don't need an image intensifier. Your image intensifier is your scope. So okay, you probably don't need it. Uh, okay. I'll tell you one thing. Wires are great possibly for uh, getting your reduction right if you don't have your labrum intact. And that's the point that I alluded to. That the beauty about the Sugaya technique is that it tells you where that piece is gonna have to sit, superiorly and inferiorly, based on your labrum. So you fix that, that's it. You've gotten your reduction dial perfectly. You don't have to second guess it. And that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. And what any particular specific complications that you expect? I mean, if someone wants to practice arthroscopic lenoid fracture fixation, do you think you need to look at something beyond? So the, the biggest problem is going to be that uh, bony fragment blowing up. And I've had that happen to me once where I've had to revert to a lethargy immediately. And I'll tell you, it was not an easy lethargy because it was already a swollen uh, shoulder. So uh, I, it was not fun. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Uh, Law is as well in the room. Law is an shoulder surgeon based in uh, Dubai. Law, your questions to Hassan, please. Uh, good evening. Thanks, Hassan. Amazing presentation, amazing presentation skills. I like your presentation and like the way you present. Thanks, man. Uh, this is the scope. This is the arthroscopic glenoid fixation. I agree. This is one. I think this is saves us. It gives the patient better or faster recovery. You avoid do the capsulotomy, and you have a better fixation, better controls of the fracture, so you can have better reduction. Maybe. The trick here is to get the portals right. I always, always struggle with getting the portals. You need the, enough space between the two portals just to avoid the conflicts between them. Do you have, do you have a particular in? Go ahead. Absolutely, and that's why you saw one of my steps, as trivial as it may seem, is insert your cannula after you would have inserted a spinal needle. I mean, I, I went through some fairly advanced stuff there, but one of the steps was cannula insertion. I know it sounds very trivial, but it's to stress how important it is in this case. So in, in cases, what's the threshold to open this, to convert it to open surgery? I, luckily, the, the only time that I've had to convert was when I just mentioned when I practically shattered that piece of bone. It was on one of my cases. But other than that, I have not been, uh, uh, I have not been required uh, to convert to open. And do you have any tips or tricks for the position of the portals? Do you have any, especially in obese or muscular patient, what anatomical, anatomical landmarks you can rely on and cho choose the appropriate portals? So, so it's really an interval that I have to insert two of my uh, portals into. Uh, I typically go medial on my inferior, just above my subscap, and I go lateral on my superior. Uh, this is switched from how I do my bank cards for one reason. It's because uh, uh, I need to go around very medial uh, on, uh, uh, on my glenoid fracture. So that's why in this case, it's an inferior medial portal as opposed to the opposite. It's typically a superior medial portal when I'm using a bank card. Got you. One of the questions asking about possibility of applying uh, applying um, a reduction clamp. Do you think there's a room to apply a reduction clamp to maintain the reduction? So reduction wires, but not reduction clamps. You saw me, I would sometimes use a grasper to mobilize that fragment and verify that I am in the right position. I sometimes also use the grasper when I'm passing it around uh, uh, the bony fragment, when I'm passing those medial sutures around so that I can get my medial fragment as lateral as possible. But other than that, no, I would rather not use a clamp. A as big as it seems, that piece is very small. 
you will crush it. I think they they're mixing up uh, with the transverse glenoid fracture. That's why that asking about the reduction. Yeah, no, a transverse glenoid fracture. There are some. There are some people who have described fixing this uh, arthroscopically or arthroscopic assisted with screws across. Uh, and it's practically the same concept as the Sugaya technique. You fix the labrum on both edges, you get the capsule, you lift it up. Uh, as long as you put the inferior aspect of the glenoid uh, as lateral as uh, uh, the uh, superior aspect of the glenoid, because the inferior aspect of the glenoid is typically free floating. It's not attached to the scapular body, but, but this is a completely different animal. Uh, because anteriorly, it's it's a totally different animal, and your force is anteriorly directed with any motion of the shoulder anteriorly. One well, last question: Do you modify your rehab protocol according to the patient, or do you let them follow all the same protocol? I have not had to modify. Uh, actually, uh, I'll be honest though: on my first one, I was a little bit cautious. Uh, but then from that point on, uh, I let them go uh, ad lib. Uh, I allowed them to mobilize it as if uh, to, to follow the bank card protocol. And okay. they do great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I think that's it. That's all yeah. the questions, Hitu. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Take care. Have a pleasure.